Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, Ask Me Almost Anything. My name is Glenn Gers, and I am the creator, the star, and <laughs> the main attraction of Writing for Screens. Uh, every weekday, Monday through Friday, if I can make it at 3 p.m., Pacific Standard Time, I will come on here. Mostly I'm working on our uh, Watch Me Write a Pilot project, but you can ask me almost anything. And then uh, one day a week, I just try and do this. I just do a full hour of ask me almost anything. Uh, and, and we got a bunch of questions today. Uh, the first one, uh, the first one up is going to be, how do I write a series. Um, if you are watching this and you are not watching it live, which is just about everybody, please feel free to ask me a question that I will answer on subsequent episodes by going to writingforscreens.com and clicking on contact me. It will open up a little form in which you send an email and you can ask me almost anything. If for some reason you are reluctant to go upon my website, you're afraid of websites, for example, it's okay. You can still ask me anything here in the comments of this or any video upon the Writing for Screens channel. Um, so that's the rules. That's, what's, that's what we're doing here. That's what's going on. Let's get to it. How do I write a series? Uh, I, got, I had a couple of uh, people write in about this. Ivy uh, wrote in and Jesse J um, asking essentially the basic question, uh, uh, this, a series they know is are written by a bunch of people. Um, a, a series uh, is obviously uh, episodic and yet somebody writes it. So the question is, how, how does that work? What do you do? Do you write the whole series? Do you write a script? For the first few episodes? Uh, do you outline everything? What what exactly do you do? Um, and, and the answer is is fairly complicated, but the, the real answer is you don't write a series. Most of the time you will not write a full series. Hello 99 Precinct! Um, uh, series are generally, they're enormous undertakings. Um, and so while there are rare examples, hello Kirby, uh, there are rare examples where a single person will write a full series or a season of a series. Um, hello Matt. Uh, the, the truth is um, that is a very rare thing. Um, True Detective, uh, Downton Abbey, uh, there are shows which, in which one person says, I'm gonna sit down, I'm going to write the whole deal um, and if you feel like doing that, cool. If you are the sort of person who doesn't mind writing six to eight 60 page scripts uh, on, the, uh, on the belief that it's better to write the whole thing because it feels satisfying and you want it to be a good reading experience, okay. But do recognize that it is uh, highly unlikely. Uh, I'm just gonna say a couple of big hellos, hello, hello. Hello, Encore. Hello, John. Hello, Marie. Maria. Hi. Um, everybody's here. Um, so here's the deal. Um, very, very rarely will a series be written by a single person. What generally happens is the, uh, the, uh, the undertaking of a series is an enormous corporate investment. It's an investment of time and money. It tends hundreds of millions of dollars go into a series. Um, they are big. Um, and because of that, they are rarely, in fact, never given to over to someone who has never written something before. <laughs> that, that truly, I, I don't believe I have ever heard of someone who has never written a script before getting to write a, a pilot, let alone a series. Um, these are it's just not the sort of thing you do your first time out. Uh, people who work in these uh, fields will, will apprentice. They will work for many years in on the staff. They will work as writers for someone else's show. 
Uh, they will work as assistants in order to get the job on the staff. Uh, this is it, usually you have to work on multiple shows before you will get to create your own. Um, so the deal is that um, if you are writing a pilot, you are essentially writing it to, to prove that you can write, to show your vision, to, to, to imagine something for everyone. Um, but in a professional sense, you are doing it as an, as an introduction to yourself. And also because, and this is true, this does happen. You never know when someone might read it, love it, and have the power to do something about that. That's a, that's a whammy of monumental proportions for that to happen. They have to love it, and they have to be in a position to do something about their love. That's tough. Um, but on the off chance that that happens, what would happen is then that that pilot script, that first script, would be picked up by that company, which that person would be in that position in, and then they would um, bring in a showrunner, a person who is experienced in creating shows. Hopefully, the showrunner and you would get along. Doesn't always happen. Uh, the showrunner basically takes over. Um, if it's, if it's a beautiful experience, the showrunner and you will work together. The showrunner will bring their experience, you will bring your talent and vision, and that's all super cool. But it does not always or often happen that way. Um, so the real deal is you are writing it on the hope that someone will pick it up and then you will get to enter the game um, at, at a low level by either being hired on someone else's staff or uh, given a showrunner and team of, of producers and writers who will help you work uh, into the business with your vision. Um, if people know of stories of, of, of inexperienced writers who wrote a pilot and got picked up and got it made, groovy, let me know. I certainly want to hear about that. But uh, the reality is um, it, you are writing the script First and foremost, because you imagine it, because you think, oh, this is such a great thing. I, I need to create it. And hopefully that will be uh, useful for me as a writer um, and it will be useful for others as a, uh, uh, to show them that I have talent or maybe to even inspire them to pick it up and begin to work from there. Um, I'm trying not to be discouraging because writing pilots is, if you want to work in, in the series world, writing your own pilot is the best thing you can do. That is the thing you should do. Um, but you'll probably have to write a bunch of them. Um, I will talk a little bit um, now and in the future, but, but today I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, when I, I was a writer of 20 years experience, having written features, having written movies for cable, um, and yet when it came time for me to say, hey, gee, I'd like to work in series, I had to write a pilot script just to show that I could do it because people will say, oh, well, you can write a feature, but can you write a series script? It's different. So I had to prove it. So I wrote a, a, an original pilot. Uh, when that was done, I did that and I wrote it just to to show I could do it, so I just went crazy on the budget. It was really expensive because I thought, let me show how imaginative and and uh, exciting I could be. So I, I took this historical incident, this book about a historical incident, and I wrote a pilot based on it. And it's, by the way, fantastic, I think. Uh, I'll try and get it out to you guys. Um, having done that, then I wrote another pilot, okay? And that one was more just like, a, I think this can sell, but mainly I need to show people that I can write a accessible, conventional, commercial pilot. Um, anyway, my goodness, you guys, have, I'm going to take a second here to read. I, I can't t uh, do the show and read the comments at the same time, so I, the chat tends to go past me. Hi, Jack, how are you? Um, Yes, a sample pilot script. In a sense, a pilot script is always a sample script. Um, uh, every every sample, uh, every pilot is in a sense a sample. You don't, you would never call it a sample pilot. You just call it a pilot, and they would use it as a sample. Um, so, gosh, I have just been blathering on about this um, without really explaining it. Here's the deal: when you want to write a series, 
you write a pilot script, the first episode of the series. Um, you write that completely and as well as you can, and pilots are hard. They're different than every other episode because you have to introduce a lot and get a lot going, and, and it's, it's, pilots are almost always not quite like the rest of the show. Um, but, but there's tons of books. Uh, people have written whole books, how to write a pilot. Go onto that internet that you're watching me on and, and search how to write a pilot script. You will see articles, you will see interviews. Read interviews and listen to podcasts, of which there are many, um, with people who have written TV shows. Um, Austin Film Festival and Screenwriting Conference. Uh, it's, it's time to type. Hold on. I'm going to type this for you. Okay, so uh, this on story is a podcast, um, it, and it's probably other things. I think it might be a book. It's on story is is this really cool thing? They do great interviews every year at the Austin Film Festival with writers. Austin is a real screenwriters uh, film festival, and they have this thing called on story. And you should listen to it because the, the TV writers are just, they're real open and, uh, and interesting and honest about it. Um, I would also highly recommend, I think I've done this, yeah. Okay. Backstory. Uh, Backstory, the online magazine by Jeff Goldsmith and his podcast, The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith. These are amazing resources. He is a terrific interviewer. His magazine is great. They get really into all sorts of gritty details about how people work in screenwriting especially. Um, and his Q&As are hour-long talks with writers and directors about uh, movies and shows. So I strongly recommend if you want to learn how the writing business goes, check into that. Also, there is a podcast called Children of Tendu. T-E-N-D-U, Children of Tendu. It's by a couple of TV writers. It's one of the original screenwriting po uh, TV writing podcasts. Very good. Um, okay, so those are some resources for you to learn about the business. But there are tons of how to write a pilot script, how to create a TV series, books, and, and you should look into those articles. Do that. So the deal is you write the pilot script and you conceive of the show as a whole. You write a concept document, um, which is kind of a pitch, but on paper. Um, it is kind of a summary or an out, uh, a, a treatment kind of thing, and everyone is different. Um, I have, over the years, collected a bunch off the internet. They're, they're just, these things are just floating around. Look them up. TV Bible. TV series proposal. Search those things, see what comes up. Get the PDFs, they're cool. So I'm gonna show you, um, I'm gonna show ya. Let me see what I got here. Um, okay, this is Freaks and the Geeks. Uh, the series Freaks and Geeks. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, show, preview, okay. So uh, this is this is the proposal, um, and this is like the uh, this is the introduction <laughs> that the 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 writers of uh, Freaks and Geeks um, gave, and then this this proposal uh, it starts here. Freaks and Geeks, a one-hour series. Um, freaks, Greek geeks, jocks, preppies, farmers. Everybody has been one of them. Which group did you belong to? And then there's kind of this description. A new hour comedy drama series follows the realistic, very funny, very touching lives of Lindsay and Sam Weir, a sister and brother, etc., etc. In other words, you're sort of describing, selling the series. Uh, you can do it in different forms. I will show you different forms. This one is very much a little essay, a little, a little pitch treatment thing. 
um, describing the characters, describing what their problems are. Uh, and um, so this, and then there's like different things that could happen in the series. The, the, the geeks camp out overnight. Uh, Lindsay will deal with Daniel's tough girlfriend, etc. Cetera, et cetera. These are different episodes. Uh, and so they just describe in a little paragraph, each one, some of the things that they could do in the rest of the series. But that's it. They just wrote the pilot and this. Uh, at the same time, uh, you have <laughs> this one. This, this one, it, it makes sense that this would be Fargo, the initial proposal for Fargo, which uh, Noah Hawley called the series document. Um, and uh, this, <laughs> this thing uh, is, let's see. So first page, there's just this little uh, fake definition. Uh, the city uh, of North, Northeastern Dakota, on Eastern North Dakota, the Red River, blah, blah, blah. And then a unique bra brand of true crime story part tragedy, part farce, in which simple, good-hearted people come face-to-face -to -face with something monstrous, okay? And that's really the pitch of the series. Um, and then there's this whole, okay, so it's, this is the story of a criminal who meets a spineless insurance salesman and agrees to kill his bully, mostly because he wants to see how far he can push the insurance salesman before he snaps. It's the story of an insurance salesman who asks the criminal to kill his buddy, bully, then beats his own wife to death, lies and cheats and steals to get away with it. It's the story of a young female de deputy. It's the story of a state patrolman. It's the story of the supermarket king. In other words, there's a bunch of who the main characters are. And it's also the themes. It's a story about consequences. It's the story of a place, which is just the atmosphere. Um, so uh, this, this document is, is pretty wacky. It's very, brand, it's very broad, it's, it's making big statements. Then there is um, this little thing about each season is a self-contained true crime story. By the way, one of the important things about true crime uh, in Fargo is uh, as in with the original um, movie, there's a little, headline that begins that explains that this is a true story the names have been changed it's all nonsense this is not a true story it's part of the humor and and wit witted quick wittedness of of the coen brothers and noah um holly anyway so there's a list of the characters um and then there's this thing because season one is a triangle we track the crime spree of lauren malva from point one to point three then back to point one and, but then there's this footnote, and um, it's here. Or wait, maybe season one is a circle in that novel comes full circle. And yet his story has three main points, so that makes it a triangle, right? But what kind of a triangle? He quote, so this is comedy. It is, it is uh, trying to get the world view of the series into this document um, by, by putting in fake footnotes and... and, and uh, uh, the, sort of a literary device that, that Nabokov used, uh, did a whole book like this, in which the footnotes are actually sort of personal uh, personal confessions. Um, and then there's the descriptions of, of the characters. And they are spoken, they're literally like spoken. Picture this, you and your wife go to a party. Okay, so the point is, every one of these pitch documents can be different. And I will show you a last sample. Hold on, sorry about that. Which is uh, one that I wrote. Um, and I will uh, eventually try to put this on my website. Uh, it was a script called Revelator. It's a science, uh, sci-fi thriller uh, drama. Um, and I just started with a kind of, like I said, I call it the big picture. I'm, I'm not hiding anything. I'm trying to hook you in. Um, uh, the, the basic premise of this series is uh, that uh, 
very, very high-tech, high-speed drones with very, very uh, high-tech, new, cutting-edge uh, imaging might actually accidentally hit an angel um, in the sense that the, the angels are physically there, but they have been able to get away from us because our technology wasn't that great. Our technology got to the point where we could go up in the, the stratosphere and we hit one. Um, and, and so basically it's about the idea that what if technology allowed us to break through to the spiritual world, that the spiritual world is real um, and it can touch us. Um, so I wrote this little essay um, about human beings have always struggled to understand this occasional contact between the spirit world and our world. Um, and, but humanity has a superpower, the ability to create, to make things, technology. And so then I get to, and I put in italics, the point. What happens when technology lets us make contact with the spirits? Um, that was, that's the, 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 the hook of the show. Um, and then I have three uh, elements to what's going to happen. One, Human beings will struggle with each other, often violently, to control and exploit this new power. Um, also, the spirits do not want us to see them. Obviously, if they had wanted us to meet them, they would have introduced themselves a long time ago. Um, and in almost every religion and mythology, there is a war going on in the spiritual realm between good and evil. So these are the elements of the story. And then I went on... Uh, this, these are what Revelator is about. Um, and then I do a sort of hypey thing, which I cringe at, but you do it. It's a moral and philosophical exploration in the form of a kick-ass ensemble sci-fi thriller. Uh, in other words, I'm selling here, but I'm selling by trying to uh, describe and hook you into the, the show. Then I have a whole section on the shape of of the series, the whole arc of the story from beginning to end. And I describe that for a couple of pages. And then I describe, because uh, they very often, the people uh, in the business will say, well, what's the first season? Because they can't guarantee that they're going to do a whole series. So what's the season? And uh, so then I describe in pretty great detail the story of the season. And then, see, and this goes I, quite a bit of detail. And then I have some rules about this mythical uh, situation. And then some rules about the technology that we're working with. And then I have the characters and story ideas. So I really have laid out a lot of the series. And yet, I got to tell you, <laughs> There's a huge amount I didn't work out. I didn't work out all the details of how this big picture I was going to spew at people uh, was going to work. Um, so those are samples of, of how you write a series. You don't write the series. You write the pilot, and then you pitch the series um, both in person and uh, on paper. If the, the pilot is really good and the proposal is really good, they will say, we want to talk to you, and you will meet with them. Uh, and, and that's a whole other development of life. Uh, there's lots of people who talk a lot about how to behave in meetings and what meetings are like. Oh, um, I would strongly advise for that the Screenwriting Life podcast. It's really good. Um, and it gets very much into the actual experience of trying to work in the business. And also it really gets into the experience of trying to be a professional writer, the emotional and personal journey you have to go on. So I would strongly suggest listening to the Screenwriting Life podcast. Um, okay. Um, so... That is the short answer, <laughs> 25 minutes, on how do you write a series. The basic thing is you don't write a series, you write a pilot. If, if you feel like it 
and you like writing and you want to write it anyway and you want to write more, I'm not going to stop you. No one's going to stop you. But you should know that if you do, in some ways, you are um, like you're unlikely to sell a whole finished series. It's possible. I don't know how good you are. I don't know how lucky you are. Those are the things that matter, by the way, both being really, really good and really, really lucky in that you can you have to think of a subject for a uh, series that a person who can green light this, which is maybe a handful of people who are running um, uh, streaming services or running networks, the producers have to say, I think they're going to like this. I think this fits into their business model and their personal choice. And so therefore, a show about, you know, there, there was a show about uh, a family and friends reacting to someone's suicide. I don't know that that was an easy pitch, but the person who made it could uh, find a place where they put it. Uh, where uh, I can't remember the title of it. But um, anyway, the, uh, the important thing to know is that... Um, sorry, trying to catch up on the, on the chat. Um, write the pilot. If you want to write a whole series, make it a limited series. <laughs> you know, don't write 25 episodes something. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's important uh, to, to get the pilot right. If you choose to write a, a full limited series, recognize that you are creating an epic, possibly just as a sample. And, and that can still be well worth doing. I mean, I, I, if somebody said to me, I want to write an epic poem, I wouldn't say, oh, I'll write the first, you know, the first chapter and then see how people like it. <laughs> if you feel this epic need and you have this epic ability, do it, sure. But do recognize that it's not like you're supposed to write the whole series and that, in fact, it can be uh, scarier for people to buy a whole series. On the other hand, it might be easier. Nobody knows that. Um, it depends on you, but you do not want to say, I have to show them every cool thing that's going to happen in this series. That's not how series are produced. Series are produced from a pilot and a concept um, and a group of skilled people who have already made series. Um, so you'll have to work with them. Ooh, okay. How does a character arc uh, in a long ser running series? Um, thanks. Uh, I think what you're saying is like, how, how do you do that? Um, and the answer is that is part of the writing room. There are, by the way, once again, there's a lot of stuff out there, books, whole books on what it is like to work on, write uh, in a series, in a room, because that's what you're doing. You're working with a team of writers under the supervision of a showrunner. Um, there is, in fact, a whole great book called Showrunners, which is in interviews with showrunners about what they do. But you wouldn't be a showrunner. You'll be working for them. Um, anyway, uh, that's the answer is the uh, the character arcs are worked out by the showrunner and the staff at the beginning of each season. Um, depending on the type of show it is, some of them sort of work it out as they go. Some of them plan the whole season and write the whole season and then shoot the whole season. Uh, it, it, that depends on a thousand uh, variables relating to the um, the producers and the streaming service and the staff and how they have arranged their working relationship. But the answer is um, a character arc is created by a staff with uh, under the supervision of the creator slash showrunner. Um, okay, so uh, that was that was only the first question um, and I have plenty of questions. So I'm going to Go on to the next one. Oh, oh by the way, uh, this is just important. I'm going to bring this up about uh, writing a series. If you want to write a series, I do want you to consider, does it have to be a script? Um, and, and for this, I got to give big kudos to Deborah Pass Pappas. Deborah Pappas is working on a graphic novel. And I say unto all of you, consider whether there is a way to not write it as a script. Uh, a script is something that uh, 
is very incomplete. You never get to make the show when you write the script. Uh, if you're very, very lucky and you've been in the business a long time and you've had some hits, sometimes you're allowed to create and run and make a show. But most of us will not get that opportunity. I've certainly never had it. Um, and and the, the truth is, if you can take this vision of yours and put it into any other form that is more within your control, within your ability to get it to a reader or an audience without someone else having to put up hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, do that. It's better. Um, nobody likes to read scripts. No ordinary audience is going to read a script. So if you can turn it into a graphic novel, if you can turn it into a novel, if you can turn it into a sort of hybrid scripty reading experience that takes out all the scene lines and puts dialogue in ordinary uh, readable form, do that. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so, 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 so. Uh, next question. Oh, related. This is sort of related. Um, there's a lot of talk about what a pilot should accomplish, but what should the last episode in the season, what should it accomplish? Uh, season finale. Uh, this is one of those things that also you're not going to get to write the finale unless you decide to write your whole series by yourself. Um, you can conceive of the, the events of that and you can put them into that document that I was talking about. Um, and, and, and I think you should. You should try and think of the big arcs of the characters in the, in the first season or in a season and where they will end, what, what choice they will make or event will happen to them or action they will take that will conclude their story for the season. That is the purpose. The, the end of the season is important. Endings are everything. Endings give meaning to everything that has gone beyond uh, before. <laughs> if you are if you are watching a story and it's like, are they going to be able to come together, these two lovers? Or is this guy going to get the throne? Or, uh, you know, is this woman's company going to succeed? These are things that you need to have a sense of where you want that to end. Is it a story about the frustrations of failing and yet the growth that happens in it? Uh, there's a really cool series called Halt and Catch Fire which is about uh, the technology world in the, in the 80s and 90s. And, and it's, it's about failure. It's about brilliant failures. Uh, people who almost were the next big thing, but for various reasons they don't get to be, and about what that means about the world and about them and what insight we get into. It's, anyway, Halt and Catch Fire, a uh, cool series about failure. So that you would want to know that when you start, you'd want to say, this is going to, they're going to end up inventing this thing that they can't sell, but that someone else's version of will change the world. Um, kind of spoiler, sorry. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so the answer is uh, season finale, uh, you, are, you are not generally writing a season finale by yourself. It would only happen if some production company had created a show, had, had allowed you to create a show and put together a staff and put it into production. Then you would come up with the season finale. If you are just writing a pilot, you need to know what you think the season and series uh, ends are, but you won't write them in detail. Um, okay, uh, next question. How do I find inspiration when I just feel blank. Um, D Dream Phaser uh, sent me this, and, and I thought it was a really interesting and powerful question. Um, he said, um, when the inspiration doesn't just roll out, what's a good way to practice the routine of creating instead of taking, uh, instead of just looking for that moment when good ideas come to mind? Um, very often, he said, I try to be productive, but I simply go blank. Um, and there isn't really something to work with, and it, it feels like I'm just losing time this way. Um, this is a great question because I believe damn near all of us 
find ourselves in this situation a lot of the time. I know I certainly have in my life. I actually spent decades wrestling with this. So I have done a couple of videos already and we'll do more on this subject. Let me tell you which ones to check out. One is create a ritual. Um, that it, this, these indirectly deal with the question of inspiration. And likewise, small steps and use what you have. Okay, it's three videos of mine that I believe help you to find a, a mechanical process by which to deal with this impossible thing of inspiration. Inspiration cannot be forced. It comes to us. It comes to us magically. No one in the history of the world has ever been able to say, this is how it works. This is what it is. Nobody knows. It's uh, literally a mystery which we have wrestled with, humanity has, because the question of inspiration is not just in creative. We, we all find this, the scientists have this issue. Um, uh, everyday work needs this issue. The question of when the, the spirit of, of, of creativity, of, of, of um, connection will strike, um, it, the ancients used to call them the muses, the, the Greeks and Romans, because they considered them these visitors who would come and zap stuff into your head uh, or not. And so everyone spent their time saying, hey, come, come on, come to me. Uh, and in fact, the, the great epics start with an invocation of the muse. Please, hey, muse, fill me up. Give me some good stuff. I want to talk about Achilles. Oh, sing to me. Um, that was a way of symbolizing. I don't think that's actually how it works. I don't believe that there are necessarily these three spirits who happen to pop in on us now and then. Um, I believe that it's more like the creative state is here in us all the time, but the, the systems have to be set up right. You have to be available to it. You have to be loose enough to uh, allow it. You have to be awake enough to notice it and to uh, spark it. There's a lot of stuff that goes into it that you cannot control. So therefore, I believe you create a ritual. You create a method. Um, method acting is, is a form of this. Uh, method actor, actors had to have to go on a stage or in front of a camera at a certain time and they have to magically feel inspired to inhabit a character convincingly. They have to feel an emotion on cue. So what Stanislavski started to do for a long time, people just practiced um, performing the emotion. Um, and, and the question was, how well could you make a face that looked like you were feeling something? And, and uh, during the 19th century, some Russians began to say, you know, there might be a better way to do this, a more convincing way where you actually feel it. Uh, but the question is, how do you get yourself to feel something on cue? And it's not your emotion. If you're playing Blanche Dubois or Stanley Kowalski, they have their life. They have their problems. It's not yours. So you have to find a way to feel someone else's emotion on cue. And that is exactly what a writer does. A writer has to feel someone else's experience when they sit down to write it. And that's why I say, really, take a look at Create a Ritual and take a look at Small Steps and use what you have. And also, really, a process of questions. Um, these are all um, in, things about the method by which you do something mechanical. Uh, you have a system by which you write um, so that you are not thinking about it and then you ha allow yourself to have it happen. Much like when you are playing music. Uh, I do not know how to play music, but I have read enough and heard enough to know that the person who's playing music, what they have to do is get so comfortable with the mechanics of playing the music that they are not thinking about that. So they can connect 
with all that invisible stuff, that inspiration stuff, and they don't have to worry about where their fingers are or, or a style, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, so that's what a writer should do. Get so comfortable with the writing mechanics, the equivalent of, of fingering on a piano or on a guitar or on a trumpet is how you outline and how you write scenes and how you create dialogue and characters by getting used to working on the page. Get used to the form. Get used to the mechanics of writing sentences. That sounds annoying and stupid, but that's the mechanic. That's what you've got to work with. And you've got to be so comfortable just doing that for practice that when the inspiration hits, you're not saying, ooh, how do I do this? You're saying, let me just get it down as fast as I can. Okay. <laughs> um, I have only done two of the eight questions I've got to do here, and you guys are all uh, asking uh, phenomenal questions. Um, bo, 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 bo. Let me just look at this. Uh, your muse will come when you have a story to tell the world. Yes, but it's actually more to than that because a lot of people go, oh, my story is not good enough for stuff. And, and, um, and that's the thing you want to do is say whatever story you are working on can have inspiration. Whatever you are doing can be art. The question is not, is it worthy enough? Like if, if it was good enough, I would feel it. No, that doesn't always work that way. It's more like I have to be good enough at this process that the magic that is already within me, because it's in there. If you are wanting to do this, somewhere in there, you have inspiration. You were inspired to want to do it. So it's there. Your imagination was working enough to think of doing it. So you have that. You, you can trust that that's there. The question is, are you willing to put in the practice and learn the skills so that you can do it fluently? Just like if you want to do a painting, you still have to learn the mechanics of how you use the brush and the paint. Um, oh, 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 I'm just talking so much. Uh, <laughs> it is organized chaos. That is exactly true. It is a, a mechanical way to do a completely emotional thing <laughs> because you can't you can't make emotions happen and you can't control them when they do. So you want to just have this other thing uh, in your uh, in your control. Um, and uh, related to that, I have a question about outlining, um, uh, <laughs> which is the many fears of outlining. I got two questions that I thought were really interesting, and so I want to read them to you and talk about them because I believe they are related. Um, 234 Pika Pika said, how can I become more creative? Oh, wait a second. I'm, yeah, I'm here. Uh, while outlining. My outlines are too dry, but if I work on the actual text, it becomes organic, but parts of the outline seem too boring. And at the same time, virtually the same moment, Jesse J wrote, any suggestions for practice or keeping writing skills sharp while taking a lot of time on the outlining process. Maybe it's an irrational fear, but I get anxious during outlining that I'm not actually writing or improving at all. Those are really interesting thoughts. Um, and, and really, um, here's the, the deal. It's kind of the same question about inspiration, which is um, if your uh, outline is too dry, what, what put your imagination into it, right? Allow yourself to not be too rational while outlining. Uh, the outline form should have room to take in creativity, including if you think of a hunk of dialogue, put it in the outline. If you feel like it's a little boring, do some, some describing and imagining in the outline. You can always just copy and paste it out later, we're, we're living in a digital world. You don't even have to retype anything. So just let it out. That's the whole point of an outline for me is it is a, a safe place to work. It is organized chaos. That is exactly what it is. You are, you are, are putting things into scene form 
so that you have a place where the creativity can lock in. Um, that's the purpose to say, well, this moment is going to have to happen somewhere specific. What's that scene? And then uh, outlining should be a, a, where everything can go and you can always pull stuff out later and put it into the text. Fine. That's cool. Likewise, this, uh, the question of whether or not if you spend too long outlining your writing will, will get messed up, it won't. Just trust me. Uh, I have never heard of someone who has lost the ability to write because they took time to, to outline. Uh, I, I, you know, if any of you hear about that, cool, let me know. But, um, coffee, hold on, it's, it's actually water. Um, <laughs> or maybe it's vodka. Anyway, um, the writing process is writing. It's creative and you're, you are improving if you are outlining or if you are writing the text. In fact, I think as you watch, if you want to watch me uh, starting now, episode 47 or 8, I think, of the step-by-step -step screenwriting, I started writing the text. And what you will see is I am constantly going back to outlining. You go back and forth between the outline and the text because there is never an end to the amount of thinking you need to do to figure out what to write. Uh, and then that, that blurt of creative writing is, is within the outlining. So you go back and forth all the time. Um, don't be, don't separate outlining as not creative or not fun or homework or for, for some other purpose. Outlining is writing. Outlining is creative. Let it be creative. Let it be fun. You are actually making shit up when you outline. What's the difference between that and, and writing? It's the same thing. It's just you're doing it in a way where you stop and think things and ask questions and you're not necessarily getting into every detail. But if while you're outlining, you think up every detail, write it down, get it in there. Who, who's gonna, nobody is going to score you badly because you write a lot in your outline. You'll just take it out and put it in the text later. It's fine. Uh, okay. Wow. 32 people. And, and look at this. <sighs> Ah, okay. Looking for some advice. Uh, Zachary Laramie. Hi, Zachary. Nice to see you. Uh, when you are in the middle of writing a script you don't think is very good and don't enjoy, do you take the time to finish the first draft? Why are we not? Okay, this is a biggie because there's kind of two questions there. One is, don't think is very good, and one is, don't enjoy. Uh, two separate problems. If you are really miserable, you have to think about why. Um, if it's because of this specific project, then changing projects should solve that problem. And that's an easy test. <laughs> um, I know from my own experience, I often begin to not enjoy working on a project. It gets hard, it gets boring, doubts creep in. But what I've just, and, and very often going to another one feels good for a little while, but pretty soon that one starts to feel bad. If that happens, it ain't the project, it's the process. And that's the thing you need to get used to and you need to figure out how to deal with. Um, and, and, but if, if easy test, if you are working on it and it's just misery every day, take a break, try something else, see if that solves it. If you run into the same problem after a while on project two, eh, alarm bells, that means it's your own fear attacking you, and you should finish one. Um, finishing them is important. If you're never finishing them because they always start to feel bad, and you always start to not like them, that's what you have to ask yourself. What is that? Um, part of it is it's not always fun. Um, I have, uh, you know, I've been doing this 40-ish years, okay? And for, for me now, honestly, it is almost always fun. And this is something I'd like to, to offer you guys. If you keep doing this, if you keep, I, like, I have written something like 40 or 50 scripts, plus a couple of novels and radio plays and plays and done all this stuff. When you have done a lot of it, then it's like the person playing the piano who doesn't have to think about the keys. And then you can just have fun doing it. And then it actually does become a lot more fun for me, not for everybody. Um, 
I know a lot of writers who have written 50 scripts and they still, you know, gag when they write. I'm sorry. I, I wish that weren't true. Um, all I can say is try and make it fun. Try and figure out how to have more fun moment to moment. Like, what can I do to make this scene more fun? What can I do to make this character more fun for me? Um, but also, I suspect you're adding a lot of criticism. You're adding a lot of, I, I fear that this won't be good. I am comparing this to other things. Don't compare your work to anything while you're writing it. I'm not even sure you should compare it after it's done, but certainly while you're writing it, don't compare it. It is what it is. You're not, not doing the best you can, so do the best you can. Because the secret is, almost everything that comes out that you think is great, somebody who was doing it, they felt crappy when they were doing it and they are comparing themselves to somebody else and feeling crappy. That is commonplace for artists. I guarantee you, I have, I have yet to read an interview with a writer or artist of any sort who says, oh yeah, I mean, I think I'm the greatest thing ever and I never have any doubts. You get one or two sort of arrogant blowhard people who posture that way, but very often they also turn out to have like massive alcohol and drug addictions and they, and they you know, there's, there's reasons that you begin to suspect that perhaps their claim of having no qualms is iffy. <laughs> so what I, you know, uh, Hemingway used to, to sometimes talk a good game and, and then not have a great time. Um, the deal is, if you are feeling bad, try to work, to focus on the, the task of the work, the mechanics of the work. Um, the more you do that, and the more you th don't think about the result, the more you don't think, is this going to make me a living? The more you don't think, is this going to make me famous? Is this going to be better than X, Y, Z, who I think is the greatest? Um, that thought, that doesn't help. It really doesn't. It will never make you better. What makes you better is thinking, how can I make this better? <laughs> That's how you get better, by doing it over and over. Boy, am I tired of talking. Um, Yes, uh, a lot of people are, are saying uh, to Zachary, and I think that that is true, try to finish it. Um, you will almost always be better off with a finished script than, than not. Um, but on the other hand, as someone who has not finished literally at three times as many things as I have finished, uh, and like four to one is, is probably a nice version of how many, I'm probably more of a 10 to one. I start things and don't finish them all the time. And that is truly my biggest regret. I really regret not finishing some of those because I thought they weren't good. I was wrong. They were pretty good. They were good enough. They were as good as they're going to be. And we are all just as good as we're going to be. You can only be as good as you are. And you can only do as good as you do. And then if you do that and you finish it and you show it to people and you learn what works and what doesn't, the next one is going to be better. It always is. Uh, so, wow. Uh, there are so many cool questions. How do I write a sad scene? That's a good one. And I have, a, I have another one. Uh, uh, Rhett Crisant asked about how to evoke emotions. Um, are you taking audience questions from here? I'm trying. I'm just way behind. Uh, you can always submit the questions um, here at writingforscreens.com uh, on Contact Me, which is just all over the place, or put them into the comments, or I will actually go through here um, and, and see if I, I've missed some questions because there are so many and I am... Uh, hmm. I'm going through Paralyzing Writing Rock from your fear of writing video. I read that Save the Cat and was determined to start writing, but keep coming up with reasons not to. Now it's been two years. Um, well, definitely watch my fear of writing video. Um, oh, that paralyzed. <laughs> okay, I, I, I got a little nervous here. I thought you were you had writer's block from watching my video, and, and that just made me feel terrible. Um, oh yeah, no, you're going through the same writer's block I did, and, and um, all I can say is um, 
try to break it down into itsy bitsy steps, small steps. Don't overload yourself. Just do a little bit at a time and see if you can get a small thing accomplished, a workable thing, whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and I would say, you know, try to, to, if you're really sitting there thinking, I can't think of anything, do it without liking it. <laughs> do it, do it falsely. Do it, uh, there's a famous uh, religious ex expression, act as if you have faith and you will be given faith. In other words, if you can't feel like it's a good scene, just write a crappy scene, right? You know, Joe walks in and throws the cherry pie on the table. He says, I hate my life. Mildred says, well, then why don't you go live another life? And he runs out the front door. You know, whatever it is, just get something down there. Um, and, and then the next day, just get more. And when you're all done and you look at it, hopefully there will be something in there, one bit, that you'll say, oh, that's not too bad. And that's all you need. You just need one little bit where something is not too bad and you can build from there. If you, I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't wanna say that I don't know anybody, but, because I do. There are people who absolutely hate their own work so much that they can't do it. Um, if that is true, I strongly suggest trying to find a therapist or a writing group, um, if they're encouraging and supportive, um, but but this that's that's an emotional that's that's a self hate pro problem, which is going to be best handled in part by looking at it in therapy ways. Uh, and there's also a ton of stuff on on um, online about working on your self esteem, on your resilience, on on whatever it is that is looping in your head because it's not all of you. There is more to you, um, and it, it's it's terribly sad and painful to watch someone that you can see has a gift, and they don't see it. So all I can say to you is, I am willing to bet that you have more of a gift than you think. Um, I can't say for sure, I don't know all of you, but but there is something in you that imagined doing this. And if you imagine doing it, that's kind of the secret to doing it. That's the magic. So you have it in you. Give yourself some safety, some protection. Give yourself a little space and say, I'm going to do this thing. Show it to a couple of people maybe and see if any of them like any of it. I think you'll be surprised how much they do. And then really, if you can't like yourself, try to listen to other people who do like you and see if, if that can help. Um, I, I, uh, I really think that that's important. If you are totally negative about yourself, don't trust that because that's irrational. Um, nothing is totally negative. Nothing is totally positive. No one is that great and no one is that terrible. So if you are feeling that overwhelming negativity, that means that feeling is not to be trusted. It's clearly some kind of twisted symptom of something. It is some kind of protective reaction that was developed for, to, to deal with something. All I can say is nobody is as bad as you must think you are if you think everything you do is bad. You couldn't possibly be that bad. So, so some, something, somebody's lying to you here and it seems to be you. That's my big thing. Just work little bits, focus on the work, not on yourself. Focus on the process. Uh, create a ritual, take small steps, and use what you have. You always have something. So start with that. Uh, I'm gonna go. It's, I've been going on for an hour. I have gotten three, four of my questions, and plus you guys have added more. Holy crap. Uh, I, all I can say is thank you. I will try to keep up. Maybe I'll start doing more of these. I don't know. I'll, I'll do what I can. Uh, great to see you all. Thank you very much.